For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. This episode was made possible in part by the generous support of the Tyndale House Foundation. For more information, visit tyndale.foundation. We are quite sure we're alone in the world and no one really sees us. No one truly cares and no one can be trusted. Um, you're alone, overwhelmed, and helpless. And so this kind of experience of the world will cause us to isolate further from other human beings. And the interesting thing is trauma specialists have found that the main resource for healing is to allow another human being into our inner world of fear and pain and helplessness. That is the solution to the lingering effects of trauma. And so trauma tends to isolate and alienate us from our siblings, our human siblings. But ironically, this witnessing of one another's pain is the source of healing. So it it has the very opposite effect of what is needed for it to be healed. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. What's your relationship with the trauma in your life, in the lives of those you love, in the lives of strangers? Where do you turn for healing and for helping? The tumultuous time that we find ourselves in serves up regular doses of the suffering and pain of others. War wages destruction. Migrants are left to die of heat exposure at the border. Hate crimes based in bigotry and fear of ethnicity or orientation or identity leave us all feeling numbed to our own humanity. It's constantly leveraged for political gain, power, money, or ugly fame. If we see the game of human culture as a zero-sum struggle for power, someone's political gain is always another's loss. Someone's joy, another's sorrow. How are we supposed to find our human siblings? Add to this the unspoken trauma that haunts so many of us. Myself, you listeners, that person in your life that seems so tough, so strong and impervious to harm. We all carry our lifetime's worth of trauma, even if we act like it's not there. But as Bessel van der Kolk's best-selling title captures so well, even when your conscious mind does that surreptitious work to ignore or deny or suppress or forget trauma, the body knows the score. But perhaps so too the spirit knows the score. Today, Bo Karen Lee joins Ryan McAnally Linz for a conversation on trauma and Ignatian spirituality. Bo is Associate Professor of Spiritual Theology and Christian Formation at Princeton Theological Seminary and has written about and taught contemplative theology, prayer, and the connection between spirituality and social justice. This conversation is a beautiful and sensitive and sometimes quite raw exploration of trauma and the human experience. But the clarity and courage reflected in Bo's presentation of how trauma threatens the human mind and body is matched by a powerful empathy and peace as she reflects on moving through a spiritual journey from victim or bystander to beloved, someone who's seen, known, and loved by God and other deeply caring helpers. The discussion that follows offers a concise introduction to the Ignatian spiritual tradition, its approach to the healing of trauma in human life, as well as a holistic comment on how trauma at the individual genetic, psychological, biological, family, and national level can be acknowledged, addressed, and acted on. Thanks for listening today. May you be well. Bo, I'm I'm so happy to be here with you in person for this conversation. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Ryan. So you've been thinking a lot recently about trauma, particularly Mm -hmm. through the lens of the Ignatian spirituality that's your area of expertise. And I thought we might start by getting an understanding of each of those two terms of the thinking you're doing. First on trauma and the kind of varieties that Mm. exist in the way they matter for our world today. And then generally a a kind of quick overview. What What do we mean when we say Ignatian spirituality? Sure. Thank you for the the good questions. One of the reasons I care about trauma is because we are just beginning to recover from the effects of this global pandemic all around us and within us. And I suspect that we haven't begun to reckon with the layers, the multiple layers of trauma that have entered our tissues, 
and are currently underneath our skin. And so a simple explanation of what trauma is, is that it's the terror that is triggered by an inescapably stressful event that overwhelms people's existing coping mechanisms. That's the definition that Bessel van der Kolk will offer in one of his most important books on trauma, Trauma and Memory, in his book, Traumatic Stress, The Effects of Overwhelming Experience on Mind, Body, and Society. But there are so many different kinds of trauma that we haven't considered carefully often in theological circles. And I think the church has something to offer the problem that is before each one of us. So I'm happy to talk about the layers of trauma that I'm imagining us addressing. That that sounds great. Yeah. What do you mean by layers? So, I mean, the first layer of trauma is the global pandemic. Our planet has experienced collective trauma. The, the threat of death at any moment, no one could escape that. And it certainly overwhelmed anyone's existing coping mechanisms. And so the stress, the anxiety, the fear, the alienation, the isolation, these things are not normal in our day-to-day living. And suddenly we are confronted with a painful new normal that none of us have chosen for ourselves. And so the, the planet is struggling to breathe under the weight of this trauma. And then there's personal trauma, which comes when we experience personal pain that overwhelms our existing coping mechanisms. There's little T trauma, big T trauma. Usually the big T trauma is one that threatens death or severe danger physically, but also emotionally as well. Now there's racialized trauma that many authors are beginning to ponder. My grandmother's hands, such an important volume. The trauma of being attacked or belittled or demeaned simply because of one's appearance. That's a layer of trauma that most people have difficulty grappling with. Whether what Whatever skin color we are, we, we need to ponder what that does to not only an individual psyche, but to a society. So minorities and majority populations included, this is a collective trauma upon our whole society. But the individuals who receive the violence or the discrimination are struggling profoundly in ways that we're not beginning to reckon with either, unless we are intentional to reckon with it. The nightmares, the, the, the night terrors, the, the inability to live life, which so many of my own students have been experiencing, students of color. And are these sort of effects what draw together the otherwise rather diverse set of experiences that you've listed so far? What is it that you see in students and in the world around you that indicates, yeah, trauma is the right sort of category for thinking through what's behind this? Well, if you take my most personal experience of it as an Asian American woman, As of November 18, 2021, research has shown that one in five Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have experienced a hate incident in the USA in the past 15 months. So you walk down the street, you might be spit on, physically threatened, yelled at simply for the way your facial features look. Mm -hmm. We're not prepared for that level of danger. This is a new threat upon our safety. The threats have always been there, but they're becoming explicit. And so my students can't sleep at night when they see this on the news, when they hear about their friend being spit on. One of my friends was spit on just recently in New York City, just walking down the street. Even taking the train into New Haven, I put my hat on and tried to cover my facial features because Michelle Goh was thrown down the subway tracks to her death. And so I don't want to give anyone an opportunity to do that to me. So that's nothing less than trauma. There, yeah, yeah. It, there's a generalized sense of danger where yes. surprising, striking, perhaps mm-hmm. traumatic particulars then start to to shape an experience of life in the world as a whole. Is that yes. roughly how it works? Yes, yes. That's right. That's right. 
I won't go into it here, but there's also research that shows that repeated daily microaggressions have the cumulative effect of trauma as well. One little microaggression may not look like trauma, but the layered daily experiences have the net effect of PTSD upon many people. So there's a growing body of literature that shows that cumulative effect as well. Something analogous to a stress injury where yes. there's no traumatic event. Right. It's not like you've right. broken your ankle all at once. Right. But over and over, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. That's right. That's right. And, and then there are the other layers of secondary or vicarious trauma that all of us experience. When we witness the trauma of someone else we either love or simply hear about. I could watch a news segment on Angelo Quinto, a young young adult Filipino-American who was killed in his home by cops, even though the family begged the cops to not strangle him as such. I hear that news story, I don't know him, and suddenly my whole body is triggered with anger. How dare they snuff this young man's life out. And it sounded so much like the way George Floyd was murdered. How dare they steal the breath out of our innocent siblings? How dare they? And so I didn't experience it, but hearing it re-triggers the stories that are around us, but also the stories that are alive in us. And so what secondary trauma does is it, it reactivates previous woundings in our own personal system. And so there's an author, Kathy Weingarten, who writes a book called Common Shock, Witnessing Violence Every Day. And she says that caregivers who witness other people's suffering are in a bind called double jeopardy, because as they companion others, their own previous traumas that may not be completely healed are reactivated. And you may think that the trigger um, is so small, but the previous wound hasn't been fully dealt with, even if I've forgotten about it. So it could be 20, 30 years past, but it's somewhere in my body's tissues. And the right kind of trigger, even though small, could reactivate this past experience, even if I thought that I'd forgotten completely about it. And so caregivers are at special risk. Like pastors and counselors? There are five professions that are particularly vulnerable. The first being the ministry leader the clergy person, the pastoral counselor, the spiritual um, guide. And then the other professions that are named after that are the health worker, the teacher, the police, and the journalist. So, hey, no wonder we're experiencing the great resignation. People are leaving their posts because this is too much for people to bear, even by virtue of being the companion to those who are suffering. How do you... You talked a little bit about the kind of the bodily and psychological effects of trauma. How do you think trauma affects our relationships to Mm. one another and then to God? One author calls the net effect of trauma alarmed aloneness that we are quite sure we're alone in the world and no one really sees us. No one truly cares and no one can be trusted. Um, You're alone, overwhelmed and helpless. And so this kind of experience of the world will cause us to isolate further from other human beings. And the interesting thing is trauma specialists have found that the main resource for healing is to allow another human being into our inner world of fear and pain and helplessness. That is the solution to the lingering effects of trauma. And so trauma tends to isolate and alienate us from our siblings, our human siblings, But ironically, this witnessing of one another's pain is the source of healing. So it it has the very opposite effect of what is needed for it to be healed. I mean, that's the way so many insidious problems work, right? They both both inflict a damage and then cut off precisely by the form of damage that they inflict. They cut off the route towards healing or recovering from that damage. That's right. That's right. And Robert Stoloro calls this finding a relational home for traumatic suffering. We need a place to anchor our pain so that we are not this cosmic orphan in the world floating around with no one to truly embrace or witness or hold our pain. 
there's this image that I love um, that's so stirring of an of a girl in an orphanage in the Middle East who is lying in a fetal position on cold asphalt, but she has drawn in chalk a mother figure around her. It's such a forlorn image of longing to be held, but what you're held by is cold chalk on asphalt. And I think this is the effect of trauma. I need to be held, but it's this illusory figure that holds me because I have shut myself off to the very things that could help me because no one is to be trusted. And so I don't find that relational home, the witness to help me bear what cannot otherwise be born in my body. In terms of the layers of trauma, I haven't even mentioned intergenerational trauma, which now studies are showing that I inherit the trauma of my ancestors. It's encoded in my DNA. That's a lot of trauma for one body. And I've only recently discovered what that looks like in my own life when I've learned of my mother and my grandmother's stories of um, utter rejection. My, My mother was let out to die as an infant, almost killed by her own mother because of the lack of food. And it wasn't until she was in her 40s that she was able to remember this her older sister had told her yeah you were almost killed by our own mom and I'm the one who rescued you and begged my mom to let you live and my mom was healed of that in her 40s but it carried into my genes somehow and I had to reckon with this experience of you know everything seems okay but why am I feeling unsafe or why am I so afraid that I may not be on yeah I may not be on safe turf here Hmm. the little triggers can bring up those old memories even of your ancestors that's in your own DNA and is there healing for that I do think so you've you've used the word healing a lot and that seemed that seems like the the fitting word for the sort of stuff that we're talking about but could you could you discuss what does healing look like what does yeah? What does it look like to have been healed in oh, such a wow. situation? That's a great question. I do remember going through a healing process over other woundings from childhood. You know, I I was not the type of person in my past who would think, "Oh, childhood wounds affect you for the rest of your life." I thought, "Oh my goodness, talking about your inner child, your inner <laughs> child, what is this nonsense?" And then I realized, okay. I'm acting in a very strange way. I can't understand why I'm pushing away the very person I love. What What is this weird attachment that I have? This anxious, avoidant, insecure attachment that I'm, you know, why don't I have this secure attachment? And I thought, can you ever be healed of these weird ways of interacting with other human beings that you love? And thanks be to God, I discovered it can be past tense. Hmm. But what does the process look like? I think the the first step of it is to acknowledge the place of wounding and then to lament and grieve and not to try to fast forward into being fixed. Um, It reminds me of Kintsugi, a beautiful Japanese art form that invites you to gaze upon the shards, behold with compassion the shards that I very gently bring mending love to. But it's not this mad race to fix a problem, but it's to gaze with love on the thing that hurts. So I think healing is first acknowledging, naming, recognizing, providing witness for the thing that went so horribly wrong in your life or your your ancestor's life and building in that compassionate witness suddenly makes the problem slightly less severe no you're no longer alarmed nor alone so we've been we've been talking mostly about trauma and the shape that it takes in our world today a little glimpse of what healing might be i gather you think that ignatian spirituality might have something to offer there and so i wonder if you could give a broad stroke sense of what sort of sliver of the Christian spiritual tradition you're interacting with and why you think it might be valuable here. Mm -hmm. So the spiritual exercises um, by Ignatius of Loyola, I think one of the distinctive gifts of Ignatian prayer is that it 
is fully simpatico with the use of the human imagination in meditation. And being able to use your imagination to revisit your own life, Lectio on Life, but then also to visit a scene. Lectio Divina is now coupled with Lectio on Life. I, I inhabit the scene that I'm reading, not only by meditating on it and imagining what it looked like back in the day, but by becoming one with it, by entering into it and seeing myself there, placing myself there. Ignatius says, place me with your son. Place me with your son in that passage, but place me there. I've just seen too much hope and too much beauty and too much healing walking through the spiritual exercises that I can no longer despair that trauma has the final word. I've seen too many examples of healing and hope where the shock of one's pain from the past or even the present is no longer impossible to bear because it's being borne by another. And I not only am in solidarity with Christ as I walk with him through the stages of his life, but as I share in this fellowship with the Christ figure, Christ is now in solidarity with me and offers me companionship and offers me this deep, intimate knowing of my pain. Maybe you could... You could start right at the beginning and just say quickly, who was St. Ignatius okay. and where did the spiritual exercises come from? So I'm informed by a stream of spirituality, which was founded by a young soldier in 16th century Spain, who was hit by a cannonball that put him on mandatory convalescence. As it would. <laughs> yeah, but he was so vain. He didn't like the way his leg healed the way it looked in his tights, that he asked the doctors to re-break and reset his leg without anesthesia. The vanity of this young soldier. And as was his want, he asked for romance novels during his convalescence, but he was only offered two books. They only had two books. And one was called Vita Christi, The Life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony, which was a popular 14th century bestseller. And that one really grabbed his attention. The other book was called The Lives of the Saints, which was also, also interesting to Ignatius. But the other, the first book, The Life of Christ, it, it, it employs a method of imaginative reading that invites the reader right into the scene. And that's when Ignatius first encountered, for him, the living Christ. And he dropped his arms, he dropped his military garb and military profession and started to pursue a new kind of glory. The motto of the Jesuits, A-M-D-G, ad maiorem de gloriam, for the greater glory of God. And so he started to put his insights into a manual called the Spiritual Exercises. And it's actually a manual for spiritual directors who are accompanying others in their journey of prayer. But it's so chock full of insight that people translate this manual for actual retreatants as well. Then it invites um, people into that imaginative journeying with Christ through the four weeks. The first week is just, who are you as a beloved human being who's also profoundly broken, both because my relationships are broken, but also because the world around me is broken and inflicts pain upon me as well. Mutual harm. I harm others and, and, and myself and others harm me. The second week, I walk with Christ through his life and ministry. The third week, I walk with him through the way of suffering. And the fourth week, have I witnessed the risen Christ? And it has been life-changing for me. I can't speak highly enough of the gift of this form of prayer. It may not be for everyone. Not everyone enjoys using their imagination or walking with Christ through the Gospels. But if we give it a chance, we might be surprised by what we find. So I take it there's some sort of continuity between Ludolf of Saxony's yes. Vita Christi and yes. how Ignatius recommends praying. What, yes. What's the connection? He reinterprets Ludolf's work in his manual by taking this method of the imaginative reading and turning that into your prayer. So your meditation is this imaginative placing of yourself into the scene. So contemplative prayer has lots of different definitions. In some streams, 
it's primarily apophatic. It's the removal of words and images. But for Ignatius, contemplative prayer is both apophatic and cataphatic. I welcome, I receive these vivid images and words that come to me in my prayer. I don't need to push them out in order to be a contemplative. In fact, his definition of contemplative prayer, which I happen to now prefer, is gazing upon the God who gazes upon me with love. That that is contemplative prayer. I can do that while I'm biking. I don't have to sit for 20 minutes in a dark corner in order to be a contemplative. I, I like that I can contemplate in nature or on my bike or in the swimming pool. So that, yeah, that sort of contemplation moves with us. Yes. But it's it's kind of home base in Ignatian spirituality is this engagement with scriptural text, right? Yes. However, you become so experienced with imaginative prayer that you're no longer wedded only to scriptures. So you might be out in nature and just having a dialogue with God. This is called colloquy intimate conversation between one friend and another, and you imagine yourself talking with Christ. And I had one moment in my um, prayer trail where it wasn't anchored in scripture, but I could hear the words of Christ to the particular details of my life, not even inspired by scripture in that particular moment. But in real time, the mystery of God's presence was revealed in part to me. Yeah. So- Gazing upon God who gazes upon me in love. Mm -hmm. How does that work healing? Such a good question. And my first thought, which may not answer the question, is that when I ponder even people in ministry, the, the level of burnout is so high. The great resignation is hitting pastors too. And I think often, even in ministry, we identify ourselves with various measures of success and we forget our core identity and we forget the way God looks upon us. I look upon myself with a much much harsher gaze or sometimes I look upon myself the way I imagine others to be looking upon me, which is the way I understand it as Jean-Paul Sartre put it, hell is other people. If I'm parasitic upon other people's approval of me and I'm not sure I'm getting that, well, I'm in my own self-made hell. But the way out of hell, of alienating relationships, this constant need to perform and and prove, the way out is to know how I am already gazed upon. There's this beautiful image well, it's actually horrifying at the same time, the still face experiment of Edward Tronick. And he um, invites the mother to lovingly interact with and gaze upon her infant or toddler child. And they're gazing upon one another with love. And suddenly the psychologist says, okay, now I want you to offer the child a still face, just go stern and blank. And when the mother puts on the still face, the child is in such shock because there's no interaction. The gaze has become hardened. And the infant is so distressed, tries to get the mother's attention, tries to get the soft gaze, but you've only got the hard gaze. And their body starts fidgeting and then they start shrieking and crying because the gaze has become hardened. And I think most of us live with this hard gaze around us because that's how we perceive others looking on us, or that's how we look upon ourselves. And so the gaze of love, there's evidence for this, even in infant psychology, that we need for our security and our safest attachment to other human beings. We need that gaze of kindness, love, and compassion. We were made for it. We were made to be loved and to love. And when I don't receive that, I become much less of the flourishing human that I've been invited to be. So I think trauma is really the opposite of human flourishing, but it's not the end of the story. And so there is something called earned secure attachment. I may have grown up with, you know, this weird parenting style that has created insecure, avoidant, ambiguous, ambivalent, anxious attachments. But if there is something or someone that offers security and safety over time, 
then I develop what's called the earned secure attachment and can then be in loving, healthy, trusting relationships with other human beings because this attachment style carries over into adult relationships. And similarly, spiritually speaking, I can grow in my confident awareness of God's loving gaze upon me, even if I didn't grow up with that originally. So that can be learned through meditation, through prayer, through spiritual community. How much continuity do you see between the sort of human relationships that are at play in, in the still face experiment and attachment theory in, in its original setting and our sense of our relationship to God? And then secondarily, how much continuity do you see between how we might heal interpersonal relationships and the sorts of spiritual practices that might mm-hmm. change our own understanding of God's relation to us? I think they're quite parallel. Now, if you were to ask what came first, interestingly, I think because God is incarnate in the world through other human beings, my first images of God often come through my first human relationships. But in that circular fashion, if my relationship to God is healed, then it also starts healing my relationships to other human beings. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the the harm first comes through humans. The healing can come first through humans, but it doesn't always. But the healing can come through direct relationship with God, regardless of whether or not the humans in life treat us properly. And so once I experience the the loving gaze and compassion of God that I can return to human relationships less parasitic, less insecure, less anxious, less avoidant, less ambivalent, and ready to be in more mature, trusting relationship, anchored in my already being loved by that cosmic parent who is no longer a still face, but the gazing upon me with love face. I wonder if I might ask, what has this form of spirituality meant to you personally? How how has it changed your life? Well, there are many different ways it's changed my life. I, like, I can give one example. Um, with the wave of violence against um, Asian American Pacific Islanders just in the past year, I remember, especially when the elderly were being targeted and several of them went um, smashing down to concrete sidewalks and were killed as a result. I remember night terrors and and having nightmares of like a lion chasing my parents in the backyard and just so, so afraid for my parents and unable to sleep. And then Noel Quintana being slashed in the subway, his face slashed and saying, I cried for help and no one helped. Angelo Quinto. And then of course the the women in Atlanta, it was too much to bear. And I think if I didn't have grounding and contemplative prayer, I would have just been an angry mess, an angry mess imploding in upon myself with rage. And I did need a place to express the the good and righteous rage. But I think if it weren't for contemplative prayer, I would have just stayed there. I don't feel stuck in that place anymore, though. And so one example would be at the height of that season when I could not sleep and, you know, my pillow is drenched with tears. I remember being with my spiritual director and sometimes these contemplative prayer moments are by myself in scripture with the 19th annotation. Sometimes it's in spiritual community and spiritual direction groups. In this instance, it was with my spiritual director, but because I am trained and seeped in this way of praying, it comes into my spiritual direction sessions as well. And I'm sharing with her my doubt that there could be a God who's holding the world together because this God certainly isn't holding my worlds together. So with Ivan Karamazov, I respectfully return my ticket. You know, I, I, even if you exist, I don't like the way you're ordering the world. So goodbye. And I was, you know, ready to say goodbye. And she just invited me to imagine, is is God with you in this place? Where or how might God be with you? And, and I just paused in this contemplative quiet 
with Sister Julie and I started hearing the wailing of women. Ah, sobbing. Kind of like the scripture, Rachel weeps. She wails and she refuses to be comforted for her children are no more. So just hearing the wailing of women like Rachel wailing for their children. And I think it's my community, Asian American women wailing for their daughters, mothers, sisters, fathers, grandfathers. And and then I see in my imagination, there's a scene of women wailing and I zero in on this scene and I realize, oh my goodness, they are at the foot of the cross of this human Christ who was executed 2000 years ago. And then it zeroed in even further. And I now see Mary holding the collapsed, breathless, executed Christ in her arms, wailing, keep hearing the wailing. But Jesus, who is now extinguished in his life, he locks eyes with me and he gazes upon me with like this depth of knowing, this depth of pained compassion in his expression. And he says to me, Bo, they killed me too. And somehow his solidarity, his knowing with the pain of being killed unjustly, of knowing what that feels like, I was companioned in my grief. I was no longer so alone. Christ knew. Not only did he know, but he experienced it. He was in utter solidarity with the hurt that my skin color was experiencing. It became more bearable to be witnessed and companioned. I mean, it didn't solve it right away. No, I stay with that Good Friday, Holy Saturday moment for as long as I need to. But then new sprouts begin to form Mm -hmm. and spring up. Yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. And for all you listening out there, there is hope. You don't have to be stuck or alone in your trauma. of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured Bo Karen Lee and Ryan McAnally Lins. Production and editorial assistance by Annie Trowbridge and Luke Stringer. I'm Evan Rosa and I edit and produce the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday, sometimes midweek. If you're new to the show, welcome friend. Hit subscribe in your favorite podcast listening app and we'd love your feedback. Ratings and reviews in Apple Podcasts are particularly helpful, but we're just as happy to hear from you by email at faith at yale.edu. We read each comment and do our best to respond and improve the show, bringing you the people and topics that you want to hear. And if you're a regular listener, it's a huge honor that you stick with us from week to week. So I'll ask you to step up and join us. Help us share the show. Behind those three dots in your podcast app, there's an option to share this episode by text or email or social media. If you took a brief moment to send your favorite episode to a friend or share with the world, not only would you be supporting the show, you'd be sparking up a great conversation around stuff that matters with people that matter. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week.